The two previous books that I worked on were both about theorizing life and embodiment in different ways. So in the first book I wrote, I was really interested in that relationship between the body and the mind and how technology was chasing that. And in the second, I was interested in um, thinking about the kind of limits between humans and other life or, or in fact, the overlaps and intersections between that. And so I was interested in these questions of how technology was not only changing our bodies, but changing our philosophical notions about embodiment, about subjectivity, about agency. And uh, the more I was researching in these fields, the more I started to realize that um, biotechnology in particular was really in intersecting with new economic regulations in ways that I found both intriguing and alarming. And so that's really what this book is about, is about looking at the way the commodification of life um, is part of the current regime of biotechnological change of life and what it means in terms of the sort of foundational notions of liberal democracy. I was interested in the ways that these changes in terms of how the body intersects with uh, economics and our neoliberal gold mode of governance was really creating something different around sort of life and subjectivity and agency, particularly because economics has now become this sort of rationality by which we measure the appropriateness of all kinds of modes of life. And so I wanted to know um, what that meant in terms of um, embodiment and futurity. There are two ways I think that the book engages with posthumanist theory. Um, first, following the work of a lot of other posthumanist scholars and indeed the work I was doing in my own earlier books, I'm interested in thinking about the ways that technology is remaking the body, but particularly the ways in which those technological changes thus create different kinds of understandings of what is the limits of the human, what is agency, what is subjectivity, uh, what uh, these philosophical notions that we have out of a history of liberalism um, shift under the pressure of technology. Uh, and so secondly, I'm interested in thinking about this history then of liberalism and particularly liberal humanism as a discourse that's historically defined the human and that is foundational to our democratic and juridical frameworks. But specifically, this is a history in which the human that it theorized was a really limited version of the human uh, that didn't include all homo sapiens and particularly didn't include people who were racialized through colonialism. And so on the one hand, I'm interested in this sort of the way in which we can reimagine the human and perhaps think more inclusively and better as a kind of version of the human. And on the other, there's this critique of the kind of um, lack of inclusivity of the term the human historically. And so the book argues for a form of posthumanism, but it's not a sort of posthumanism that is, you know, better than or beyond or or um, uber from the human. But it's really about a different way of imagining what it means to be the human species, and particularly to imagine the human species not through these kind of hierarchies, because they separate the human from other forms of life, but they also create hierarchies um, largely through racialization within humans and our current um, philosophical and political frameworks. And so a critique of the consequences of that history is another huge part of how the book engages with posthumanist theory. I think the most important thing to think about in terms of the relationship between science fiction and daily life is that, well, Science fiction is often set in the future. It's not really about the future or about predicting the future. It's really about looking at the technologies that are having an impact on daily life right now, and often to try to draw attention to their implications or their effects by extrapolating into a future or by exaggerating into a future. But the political or philosophical or thematic engagement is really about the present day. So certainly science fiction, I think, is interested in extrapolating futures, but this interest in the way the future unfolds is about the ways that technology changes um, all kinds of things in daily life that perhaps don't seem to be related to the technology itself. 
So uh, a sort of popular example of this uh, that gets repeated a lot in science fiction circles comes from Robert Heinlein, who is definitely not my favorite author, uh, but he has a way of talking about this that I think um, this metaphor is helpful. So he says, you know, if you're thinking of a world of sort of horse-drawn locomotion and somebody's going to invent the automobile, that science fiction is not just about um, imagining and inventing the automobile in that world without cars, but it's also about imagining the traffic jam. So it's about not simply how we could invent a new technology and how that technology might make our lives better or improve something, but it's about really thinking through the consequences of how our patterns of daily life thus gonna be changed because we're now using this new technology instead of older ways. And so while these extrapolative techniques are often used in industry or in scientific research themselves, I think a real difference with science fiction is we want to imagine not only the positive benefits or the ways people might be using a new technology, but we also want to look at the sort of larger picture of who might be left out, what patterns of life might be changed, or what unanticipated problems might also come with a new technology, because it's really about the, that technology's impact on humans' um, quotidian life. That's the main focus of science fiction. So this is really a central concern that the book wants to explore, and particularly I explore this through a critique of the notion of human rights as a discourse that will be sufficient to protect people from commodification, because the commodification of life, the patents that are happening on genes, the ways that um, uh, humans are being encouraged to augment or change embodiment in order to increase their productivity so that they can, you know, be, perform better at their jobs or be more efficient. All these kinds of like economic rationalities um, have an influence on how technologies are designed, how we imagine using these technologies. So where I see this creating a crisis in ethics and governance uh, is in two kinds of ways. So one is simply the very fact that life is being privatized. Um, things like Terminator seeds that Monsanto um, would commodify. And so the capacity to sort of grow plants for food becomes something that you also have to have a corporation involved in licensing these, these seeds. And so that kind of way that economics and profit um, infiltrate everything, including these like really basic things like being able to produce food for ourselves. This is one of the ways that I think um, the way the bioeconomy is intervening in and actually changing how biological life works is something that should be of concern for um, uh, governance. Another question would be more around questions of um, things like organ transplants or surrogate pregnancies, ways that biological parts or biological capacities of some human bodies are utilized for the um, ends or benefits of different human bodies. And perhaps on its sort of surface, that doesn't necessarily seem like a terrible thing, but when you put these technologies in a larger sort of economic history of how they've developed and where their sort of um, sites of activation are, where are the places where people are selling surrogate labor services versus who are the people that are buying these, who are the bodies most likely to end up being donors for organ transplants and who are the bodies most likely to gain these organs. We can see that these histories match up really strongly with um, colonial histories and other histories of exploitation. And this has, again, everything to do with the sort of overarching um, economic rationality that uh, guides everything and ensures that people who have access to economic resources have more choices, um, more rights, as it were, and people that have only the sort of mere fact of their human embodiment are left with having to commodify part of that embodiment to survive in a world in which economic productivity is this sort of unquestioned baseline. So it's the intersection of the two that I'm most interested in thinking through in this book. So the book draws attention to the commodification of life through a number of industries or case studies that I look at, and then I 
also integrate that within a sort of larger intellectual history of what underpins these industries and some of the sociological factors that are shaping how these industries show up. And then, of course, um, science fiction books that are exploring these similar kinds of questions. So I have chapters on a range of technologies that are about intervening in life, shaping or changing life uh, in different kinds of ways and to different kinds of ends in the current um, biotechnological moment. So some of the chapters explore things like life extension and cryonics, uh, imaginaries that um, suggest we could synthetically create human laborers, so things like Westworld, for example, and understood in the context of both a history of colonial labor, but also extrapolated into the gig economy and the ways that human workers are now imagined not as sort of full employees, but sort of segments of skills or services that are activated at certain times. So while it's still humans rather than, than robots or synthetic beings performing this labor, the industry intersects with them in a way that kind of um, divides them up into capacities as if they were machines. And so it's the effect of that imaginary on the actual practice that I'm interested in thinking through in the book. And then other chapters look at things like synthetic biology or transplant surgery, IVF um, surrogacy and other reproductive technologies. And then the pharmaceutical industry, particularly it's sort of patenting of indigenous knowledge um, through seeking to patent plants that have been cultivated through long histories of indigenous practice. And also this notion of sort of optimizing ourselves through um, an ever increasing range of chemicals that we're encouraged to consume in order to make ourselves the most efficient, the most productive, um, the best employees for capitalism. I'm working on two different books right now, and both of them are really in the same kind of terrain of how um, imaginative capacities or imaginative discourses end up having material effects and trying to uh, both illuminate how the imagination and the materiality are co-constituted and also to add a sort of larger history to understanding how those kinds of relationships are showing up in our present moment. So one project has to do with economics and science fiction. And here I'm really motivated by the 2008 crash and debt crisis um, following again in the work of many other scholars who are now looking at culture and economics and many um, filmmakers and television showrunners and authors who are also now creating um, fictional works that are exploring these intersections. And here I'm in thinking especially of the sort of ways that financialization creates um, market profit through things that are essentially um, stories or speculations or um, hedging bets on possible outcomes, things that are very abstract and more narrative-like. So I'm interested in thinking of like the economy as a kind of science fiction in a way. And then the second project has to do again with how a science fiction kind of capacity has now become uh, more generalized and more part of the fabric of everyday life. And this is science fiction world building and science fiction ways of extrapolating and imaginatively creating and then sometimes inhabiting through fan practices and cosplays these alternative worlds. And I'm interested in the way that um, uh, alt-right and extremist discourse, especially the kind of conspiracy theories like QAnon and, and things like that that are um, animating um, alt-right politics today, how they have, again, this um, relationship to or mirroring of the um, work of writing speculative fiction. And so I'm trying to sort of think through what does it mean to be in a world that is structuring itself like the logics of science fiction.